Hey everyone and welcome to Television from the Multiverse, the DC TV podcast from Mailfuzz TV. I am Peter and for the first time I think since this show started, I am on my own because Connor is on vacation and as a result of that, this week's episode is a solo affair where I will be talking to you about Supergirl, Batwoman, The Flash and Arrow from this past week and we'll try and make heads or tails of some of the weird things that happened or whether or not they were good or bad and we'll see if they weren't mostly bad again this week which is a bit of a trend unfortunately the last few weeks but uh that's the plan that's what we're going to do and we're going to start with uh with supergirl um oh that's it i never actually checked if there was any any real news actually there was one thing that i did see uh, just before actually uh batwoman has been uh picked up for the back nine so uh much like we kind of assumed uh, Batwoman is actually going to be a full 22-23 episode season. Uh, back 9 implies 22 specifically, so um, yeah, so that's that's not a half show, half season show like Black Lightning or Legends of Tomorrow, that is going to be a straight full uh, 22 episode, uh, which makes sense given that it's kind of the, the, the real replacement for Arrow, even though Arrow might be getting an actual spin-off as well. So, um, but yeah, I'm not going to waste any time this week. I'm just going to go straight into it because I, I have no one to banter with. So let's talk about Supergirl. Season 5, Episode 3. It's called Blurred Lines. So Supergirl this week had Kara face a dilemma where she wanted to be a good friend to Lena. She wanted to prove that she was she was loyal and that, that they were still the best of friends. Uh, she overcompensates a little bit by going to pick up all of her favourite food from around the world. She gets her scones from Ireland, which is probably a little wink wink because uh, that's where the actress is from. Um, uh, Lena's the actress, obviously. I don't mean must have been honest. Um, and they also give you um, what was it? Like it was coffee from Milan and uh, something else from somewhere else but it was you know it was a list of things from around the world uh, and this is something we've seen in other shows I remember Clark picking up Chinese food from China <laughs> and Lois and Clark in like one of the first couple of episodes so but the big thing is is that Lena starts talking about uh, what she needs to complete her research because she's researching things about about helping people and some such and she's wanting to, and the only thing that would give her answers is the stuff that Lex wrote in these journals, but that's been confiscated with everything else, it's in security under lock and key, and this is where, like, she's properly being a Luther, she's clearly manipulating her into suggesting that Supergirl, uh, you know, that Kara as Supergirl go and break in and get these journals, because she can, she has the power to do so. Uh, and Kara's like, yeah, I mean, why don't I just get them for you? And Lena's like, no, I can't ask you to do that. Um, and she's like, you're not asking, I'm offering. But it's clear, like, it, you, you get it in the scene. Lena was directing the conversation in that, that direction, and Kara just offered up exactly what she wanted, and now Kara's made this promise. And I, I was kind of frustrated with this at first because I felt like Kara... Like, it did feel like such a, a clear crossing of lines of her, of her, you know, like, again, later on in the episode, when Alex kind of brings this up with her, uh, Kara does say, hey, technically I've broken the law tons of times, and she gives us, gives us examples, but as Alex points out, all those examples are kind of with a really good intention, they're, they're all things to, to save someone, or save something, or, or whatever, this is just for the personal gain of one person, you're going to break into a building, and uh, a highly secure building at that and but i'll give it some credit because i actually liked that supergirl did actually struggle with this this thing i liked it when she brought it up again with alex later she was actually regretting making that promise that she she was she regretted offering that because she realized after she said it that hey that's maybe actually something that i shouldn't do that's <laughs> something that doesn't feel very supergirl or superman like right and so it wasn't spectacularly written, but at the very least, I appreciate that the character did have some second thoughts about it. And even though she does ultimately decide to go through with it, based on you know a speech that James gives to her about you know him showing up to help Supergirl, say, "Oh, if my friends in need, I'm going to show up and help." And that's kind of like inadvertently, he kind of guilts her into doing it. He doesn't know that she's even th considering this, but she ends up doing it. And you know, part of the the, the cheesy music montage at the end, which is th every episode this season's had so far, and. Th Again, I'm pretty sure most episodes have it anyway, but I'm really noticing it this season for some reason. And I don't know if it's just because enough is enough and it's starting to bug me, <laughs> or if it's because it's actually more consistently being used. But yeah, we had a cheesy piano music playing as the montage played out at the end. 
Uh, but she does go through with it, she does steal these journals, which gives Lena what she needs, which is uh, how to- <laughs> it literally comes up after, after decoding the, the journals, it comes up saying how to manipulate Q waves to to achieve mind control or something to that effect let by, by Alex Luther like I like how he put by Alex Luther in his own journal um so again it's this idea that she she seems to have kind of noble intentions but we're looking at mind control and even earlier on when a test marker who's now you know the, the AI is saying hey like asking what to do and whatnot and Lena's complaining because she's been doing some testing and she can uh, she can control the main potentially, or she can, or, or wh whatever. Like all our tests point to being able to take control of the main, but she doesn't want to do that. At least not completely. And test makers like, yeah, you don't want to control everyone. You just want to make them better. But it's that kind of thing where it still sounds bad. Like it still sounds like you're just going in and being a dictator and changing people. Uh, it actually makes it. Uh, you know what? It reminds me a lot of a certain thing that was revealed in the movie Serenity based on Firefly and how a certain thing happened. Uh, the, the intentions that led to a really bad thing kind of started with this idea of making people better through some sort of subtle control. Um, so that, that made me think of that and you know I always like to bring that up because it's from Josh Whedon, the creator of the hit television show Buffer the Vampire Slayer. And isn't that nice? If you're watching the video version, you'll see that I've got a photo of Firefly in Connor's usual box, and Firefly does not look anywhere nearly as judgmental at me when when I make a Buffy reference, so that's that's nice. And where is that old scamp? He's behind the computer monitor right now, uh, at the time of recording. So, that was kind of the Supergirl Lena stuff. Um, Lena feels very villainous, uh, and even if she turns out to not be that villainous or she tries to have some redemption, if she genuinely believes that what she's doing is right right now, uh, she's not a, she's, you know, she, she's not at the very least morally very dubious because what she is doing is straight up wrong and it's under this guise of doing it for the right reasons, but what she's looking at and the potential tech that she'd be using is very intrusive and invasive and it's kind of thing where if she does believe she's doing the right thing, I still can't get behind her as a good character right now. And not that I think I'm necessarily supposed to, but I know a lot of people really like to stick up for Lena and say that she's, nah, she's she's she's, she's good deep down and yada yada yada. Um, and some people have become very attached to Lena, I think, because, I don't know, just because of the actress or just because she's been here for seasons now and they don't want them to do the obvious thing of her becoming villainous just because she's a Luther. Um, but the sad part is, is that I don't think this show is written well enough to make me care about them doing the obvious thing. I would much rather they do the obvious thing and make her be evil if it gives us a good villain and a good antagonist for Supergirl than I am them trying to straddle this line with this moral ambiguity and, you know, trying to make something a bit more complex and engaging. And while I would appreciate that if I believed the writers of this show could pull it off, I don't for a second think they can. This is this is not Breaking Bad. <laughs> this is this is Supergirl on the CW. And I think admitting what the limitations of that are is is a big deal. And I'm not saying that shows just because they're on the CW shouldn't aspire to be more. Of course they should be. Um but this is not like we've got we've just got a big new writing team for this season, right? This is the this is you know we've had four seasons of this show, uh, we've had some different people in charge, of course, but I feel like trying to pretend we can do a storyline that is of a much higher caliber, uh, but we're probably ultimately going to whiff and just feel muddy by the end of it. Uh, I I think would be better to avoid. So. Um, I kind of hope she just goes full evil because I think honestly it'll it'll be they'll just pull that off better. You know, it'll make more it'll be more interesting, and seeing her go full with her could be entertaining. Uh, yeah, and honestly, I'm I'm kind of sick of the the fake friendship stuff. I'm sick of the sitting there pretending to be nice to each other and. Lena's secretly got all these secrets. Uh, you know, it's kind of the flip of Supergirl hiding who she is from her. Now we've got Lena hiding who she is from her. And I get that that's supposed to be interesting because we've flipped the tables and now Lena's the one hiding something. Um, But Lena always felt like she was hiding something. <laughs> she always did, even when she wasn't. 
uh their chemistry is kind of weird and i know i'm upsetting a lot of shippers right now by saying that but i don't think they have great chemistry i, I feel like we have always had this weird awkward thing with with linus specifically uh specifically uh who always feels like she's not being completely honest i never really believe what's coming out of her mouth um and that's including when she's in scenes with other people. I don't really believe her when she's in a romance with Jimmy or, or whatever. I never really believe anything she's doing. I always feel like she's got an ulterior motive. She just has the delivery that make, that sells that to me. Um, So, just make her evil. <laughs> I, I don't think she's interested enough <laughs> to, to not just make her evil. Uh, I feel like making her an arch nemesis, but one that sticks around and is never necessarily the season big bad, but is always kind of around as an antagonist. Kind of like Lex is supposed to be with Superman would actually be something that Supergirl would maybe benefit from. And it would actually go with her delivery of all of her lines, maybe. I don't know, something, something not right. Uh, damn. Anyway, uh, other plot lines, we have this uh, tattoo spider lady. Uh, where the spiders infect someone, some guy that the uh, English dude was going to talk to, and I should really learn his idiot name, shouldn't I? Uh, William, William Day is his name. I, I honestly, I would never have guessed that in a million years. Uh, William Day is uh, trying to talk to this dude at a club at the start, and uh, our monster of the week, our villain of the week, uh, sort of seduces him, takes him out of the bathroom, and a spider tattoo sort of comes to life and goes into his body, and he kind of dies. I will say that the edit in here was very weird for me. It felt like this happened far too quick. They're, they're literally kissing for a second, and it happens. It didn't feel like it was paced properly, but, I mean, I guess they just had... They were running maybe short on time for the episode, and this was where they felt they could cut a couple of seconds. Uh, and so they did. So I, I guess that's just... Just, uh, just it felt it felt quick, cut so quick that it was ineffective in any way. Not, not that it would have been super effective because it's just a typical monster of the week uh, kills its victim at the start kind of thing. Um, the the villain straight up has some Spider Man esque powers. It's, she's shooting webs later on. Supergirl gets webbed to the wall and she's heat visioning and uh, all the rest of it. And ultimately, what this thing is is never really all that important. Maybe it'll become more important later. Um, they explain it as some sort of alien thing and. It's going after people. Uh, I guess the more important part here is that uh, William was involved with this guy, and at the end of the episode, we see William accept money from this guy. He's like, no, just keep doing what you're doing. It's all very covert, you know? He's up to something with a group of people, and we don't know exactly what it is, but something's going on. And Kara suspects that he was lying about it because she wanted to look into it, and he tried to shut that down. Uh, she, you know, he whatever like you know it's fine like there's a couple of scenes with actually things happening more interesting perhaps is the fact that uh mal which is uh jean's brother whose name i finally remembered is that, i mean mal's short for something but mal's easy to hear, easier to say um mal uh takes the form of someone who knows kelly kelly's old college buddy or someone uh, who happens to be played by Sean Astin uh, from The Goonies and Stranger Things and Lord of the Rings. And I'll say Lord of the Rings because I know everyone's going to yell at me if I don't say that one, but I don't care about Lord of the Rings. Goonies and Stranger Things are more important. But he, uh, so he, we have this random relatively big guest star. And I say relatively big, it's not like he's like a huge name, but he's been in enough stuff that people care about that it's kind of like, hey, Sean Astin's in this episode. Uh, and he's just kind of there, because I actually noticed the photograph of him, like, uh, before, like, he appeared. I, I didn't realise that was meant to be the focus of the shot, but I noticed that Sean Astin was in a photo with Kelly. I was like, was that Sean Astin? And then all of a sudden, like, you know, the camera turns and Mal's standing there with Sean Astin. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, so he uh, goes to Kelly, and the reason why is because obviously we heard last episode he wants to use her device uh, with the Q-waves or whatever is going on, and because it'll unlock his mind and his powers and... Uh, we find out that he's got this, what he calls the Inception power, uh, which is to make people do things. It's basically just him controlling people and making them do whatever his bidding is. Uh, but he's calling it the Inception power. And yeah, so he's with Kelly for a few scenes and then eventually, you know, the thing turns on and like he, he's, he's, he's at full power. Uh, he's, he's actually going to make Kelly uh, stab herself in the throat with a piece of broken glass, which was a nasty visual and kind of was like, oh, that's kind of intimidating. Um, it makes him a bit more interesting that he's got this extra really kind of vicious power now where he can be dangerous with people. So uh, in, that, in that sense, I guess this is the strongest of the three episodes and that they made him maybe the most dangerous he's been yet, the most interesting. The shape-shifting, of course, was already pretty dangerous, but this felt quite dark, uh, what almost happened here. Uh, I will say Kelly's 
performance when she was like sort of like moving in a really rigid way to sell the idea that she's not moving her own body was kind of kind of funny but maybe more just funny because of the sound effects that were adding into it um because i don't care about kelly I, I you know i haven't you know her blandness runs in the family with jimmy apparently uh although she's even more bland somehow and like i wasn't gonna i'm not gonna say i was rooting for her death so she'd be gone i mean she actually kind of leaves by the end of the episode because she picks up a special ability because she was in the room uh with the device when this all happened she actually has this ability now to always see uh, who mal is even when he shapeshifted because she's like you know she's out in the the foyer of the, the the building and supergirl and all that are there uh jean's there and like she's like hey like now he's the janitor now he's this and so mal knows that she can see him now uh, which is why she gets sent away with jimmy so maybe her and jimmy are going to be gone for a few episodes uh, that'd be nice because they don't add a whole lot to the episode oh uh, to be fair jimmy he basically just agrees to help Supergirl investigate this murder, um, which leads to the, you know, the, the, the fight in the alien sort of spider lady woman. Um, although the woman herself is not an alien. She's kind of been taken over, kind of venom or, you know, the thing style, you know, whatever you want to call it, possessed, whatever. Uh, and he, he has this really funny little moment, which I think was an ad lib. Uh, and I say ad lib, I mean, improv improvisation, I should say. It's not, it's not a line. But... Uh, where he offers to help Supergirl with the investigation, and he's like, "What well, you don't want a super friend?" He's like, oh, "Of course I do." And it cuts to this wider shot as he's, he's he sort of says bye, and he's walking away at the corner of the building outside. And he does this thing where he turns, and I think he almost hits the corner of the building, like the you know the the, the, the window because it's like a sort of glass you know lobby kind of wall thing exterior. And I think he he realizes he's about to hit it, hit the corner of the building. So he does this little sort of turn the like it is like a full spin round the other way from the way he turned originally. It does a sort of full three sixty, uh, not three sixty. Sorry, a, a one eighty. I should say not a three sixty because that would send him back the way he came. No, he does like a, a one eighty round the opposite spin. So he sort of spins to his uh, his left, realizes he's going to hit the corner, and then sort of smiles like a sort of goofball and sort of spins around the other way. And walks, but it just it played it played nice enough, and I think the reason why it played nice enough is because I don't think it was in the script. I think this was just a moment they captured because he intent, you know, uh, not intentionally. Uh, he he genuinely was going to walk into the building and just kind of improvise to get around it and played it off as a cute little oh I'm a goofball kind of moment, and it actually felt more like Jimmy Olsen than he ever usually feels. Uh, which is kind of funny. Uh, which I mean, maybe I'm not giving enough credit. Maybe this was this was planned, but it, it felt more accidental to me. It felt like he he realized he was about to hit the thing, so he just kind of improved and, and span around the other way. And it felt kind of like a goofy little scene ender. And they kept it in because it looked good and you know, fine. Um, so yeah, so Kelly and Jimmy leave, so she's safe because now she's a target because Mal knows that she can. She, she's like, she's basically a weakness to him now because she can see him coming. Uh, and then uh, the final plot uh speaking of mal leads us to jean um nia who's getting very frustrated with brainy in fact at the end of the episode kind of tells him to quit it with all the poems in fact at one point when they're in bed together and she wakes up from a nightmare brainy has like a scroll he's got like an actual scroll that he's got a poem on that he's about to say to her and she's like no shut up please no more poems but at the end she's basically like oh you come on too strong you come on with all these poems all this food everything everything all the time and she actually hurts his feelings and he leaves because it's like, well, he told me to be myself and being myself is being 100% all the time. Well, that's just who I am. <laughs> uh, so it kind of hurts his feelings because he's, he's, he's essentially holding back a lot all the time. And so that's kind of hurt him because he thought he could just be himself around her. And unfortunately, that was too much for the poor girl to take. Uh, but the main thing here is that she is asked by Jean to help him using her dream powers to sort of undiscover or rediscover the memories that that we're taking from him and she uh and my, my big complaint here and i've said this before in the past when we've had flashbacks or stuff in john's head to his past but why is everyone a human in his past why aren't they all green martians it makes no sense that he would be a member you know one one of two things are happening either they were green martians at the time and he's just remembering everyone is human in which case why and or or they were pretending to be their human forms on mars and if so why <laughs> like neither of them makes neither of these options make sense um I, I guess if you wanted to try and head candidate you could say well it's coming through nia's like point of view because it's her powers so she's seeing what she knows them as even though she's never seen some of these other characters these other kids that are in the flashback i don't know 
none of it makes sense. It's clearly just for budget. It's just because they don't want to spend more money on the CG or the face and what that. Whatever. I get it. It's just something I need to point out because it stuck out to me. Um, but we find out that his brother uh, Mal had a problem where he. In fact, I was referencing Firefly earlier. He's, this character is Mal. Uh, not Malcolm, of course, but Mal, all the same. Uh, but no, so his brother turns out wasn't connected to the hive mind or whatever all the green Martians are connected to, and that made him kind of a, you know, kind of the uh, red-headed step trail to the community, and everyone was kind of making fun of him. His dad tried to help. We get to see his act- the actor back playing his father, and that's all cool. And we find out that he was kind of ostracized by his by his father uh, in an attempt for him to like sort of connect with the the hive mind and sort of become you know naturally get his powers it's, it felt a bit cruel uh we see jean kind of coming by later as a, a sort of late teenager or whatever <laughs> i mean it's just david harewood but you get the impression he's supposed to be younger here and he's like hey father always believed you would eventually you know be able to come back and you'd get better and you know i've been written for you and, and yada 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 um and that this that this whole thing ends with Jean getting very angry. You know, when they would come back from the the flashbacks, he's like, "Oh, my father did this. This was a cruel thing." And he wiped all of her minds. And you know, he he, he you know, or my brother was a child. He needed help and aid, and instead he was cast aside uh, to be alone. And no wonder he you know he's grown up angry and and you know become became a traitor. He was basically abandoned. You know, the, the, who who can blame him for for becoming what he's become? Kind of thing. Um. And he seems to, like, really hate his father at this moment. And later on, uh, Nia wakes up having dreamt more of what happened in her, in her sleep and comes by and says, hey, this is not going to be easy to see, but I did see more stuff and you're going to have to see it. And what we find out is that Jean is actually the one who erased their memories of him, um, which he sees as a really big deal in betrayal because uh, basically, like... You know, death is is obviously not loved <laughs> by the Martians, but it's more a raising memory that's seen as the really bad thing because they all kind of share memories. It's all in kind of the hive mind, and but erasing the memory of someone is like the truly vicious, most vicious thing you can do essentially as a Martian. And he thought it was his dad that did that. And he was angry at his dad, but now he finds out that he's the one who did it. He basically couldn't take how 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 much pain his father was in because of what what his brother became. Uh, that he he did this so he, he begs nia to never repeat what she's what she's discovered here today uh which, which you know she she promises not to um so uh and yeah and i was wondering for a second how jean managed to find because uh, he shows up to save kelly at the last second when she's about to stab her own neck and i was questioning that at first but i think because ed mal like got his powers back and he became like a full green martian or whatever or whatever you want to call it, he, um, and that's the other thing, his, his, his extra power, this Inception power, is an oddity, it's not something that he should have, it's just something that he does, or for some reason, um, but, so instead of having the other powers that he should have, he, he had this instead, but anyway, um, I, I, I think it's because he's, like, connected to the hive mind after this, so Jean can sense him, and that's why he gets here, although, that said, though, that means he could just find him wherever he wants, so maybe not. I don't know. If anyone has a good reason for why Jean's able to, like, know he's here and come and save Kelly, please feel free to tell me. I kind of assumed it's because because of, you know, what it just triggered from the machine and Jean could sense it. That was my guess. Maybe that's still true. I don't know. But let me know. Uh, but that was basically Supergirl. It, it's probably the best of the three episodes. I, I think there was some viciousness to Mal's new power that I kind of liked. Um, Kelly being able to see him when he shapeshifted at least gives her a plot purpose, if nothing else. Uh, her and Alex have very little chemistry, if any. Uh, so that's the whole thing. Oh, I forgot to mention Supergirl when she's worried about uh, having this like lunch date with with uh, Lena. She uh, she's eating two donuts. She's dual wielding donuts, as I put it um, in my tweet <laughs> when I got to that. Because you know we always pop for some uh, donut eating on Supergirl. Um, although of course Connor can't have donuts anymore. Oh, that's a shame. That's a shame. The poor ginger. Uh, but uh, so that was that was that was a fun meta moment just for me. It doesn't make it good, but <laughs> I always pop for. Um, it was probably the best episodes of the three. It's not saying a whole lot. I think it's it's not done a whole lot to uh, you know really grab me yet. I will say 
this felt the most balanced of the episodes. It didn't get bogged down too much. I mean, there's a bit of William it advanced his plot and about his mystery, but it didn't bog us down in in uh, Andrea's stuff. You know, she was in one scene, which was which was I think made this a little bit better. And um, it seemed to balance like the three or whatever plots that it had fairly evenly. Um, yeah. So yeah, Mal is a little bit of a better villain, and. Uh, it didn't it, it completely ignore that Supergirl shouldn't be breaking into like high security places to steal stuff for Lena. Uh, I, I'm glad that that was a conflict in her mind, uh, and even though she made the wrong choice, I'm okay with her making the wrong choice. But the fact that she struggled with it and knows that maybe it's something she shouldn't do, and did it uh, essentially in a moment of weakness, um, and I'm sure it's something she's going to regret later. Uh, you know, even if it's not until she sort of realizes that Lena's up to no good uh, or doing something morally dubious. So. No, that was, uh, that was Supergirl. Well, that'll take me on then to Batwoman, Season 1, Episode 3. It's called Down, Down, Down. And much like the Supergirl episode, I'd probably say this is the best of the three. Bar's not incredibly high, although I do think the gap between this and the first two is probably a little bit bigger with Batwoman than Supergirl, which is a good thing. What I'm saying is, is that I think this was a notable step in the right direction, versus the first two. It still has some of the problems, of course, it's not perfect. Uh, in fact, there's one thing I'm going to rant about in a minute, but um, it, this was the one that definitely felt the most like I could kind of get into the show as a, as a sort of like proto-bat show. Kind of in the same way that Supergirl was like, okay, we don't have a Superman show. Um, of course, I like Supergirl as a character a lot, but especially at the start of the show, she didn't really feel like Kara from the comics. She felt like they wanted to do a Superman show, but just with a woman instead, right? That was kind of the thing. Like, they would give her a job that kind of felt kind of like Clark being at Daily Planet so on. Uh, and I think with, with Batwoman, they're not doing necessarily that same mistake to a point. Um, you know, they're not trying to make Kate too much like Bruce, which is nice. I like that at the very least. Um, does she feel like Kate from the comics? Um, a little bit. Not, not like... Not as like perfect, but it's sort of thing where it could easily sort of squeeze into that quite comfortably, probably without without too much effort. But, um, but what I'm saying is, is that I think the rise to Kate actually deciding to put on a suit and being like her own identity, being the Batwoman instead of just being Batman. Not that she names herself, uh, at least in this episode. I mean, technically Sophie names her, but like no one hears her say it, so it's not like. I mean, I guess it'll just catch on because it sounds the best. <laughs> It's so funny though, because they say like, what we call her, we call her, you know, on the radio at the end, like, and actually, I hate the narration from Kate, I do like hearing radio broadcasts though, I, I think whenever we hear that throughout the episode, it kind of works, I think it fits the tone of Gotham City, like hearing like the, the same radio voice, like sort of talk about what's going on, like, the bat's back in town, like God, uh, but you know, the voice is like, ah, the bat's back, but she's sexier and sleeker, but what do we call her, do we call her bat lady, bat chick, and it's kind of funny that they had to avoid saying bat girl, because bat girl is also a thing, uh, and they've obviously not decided yet, probably, if that's been a thing in this world yet or not, we've heard a Robin reference, so we know there's been a Robin, has there been a bat girl, uh, that would be exciting if there was, I'd love to, I would think we'll get Barbara on this show, but I'd love, like, I think, because Cass is in the Birds of Prey movie, I feel like Stephanie Brown is the one that's perfect. Like, have Stephanie Brown be your full-on sidekick. Do it. Do it, you bastards. Um, anyway, but don't ruin her. <laughs> don't ruin her. But, no, I think the action side of the episode, the build-up to her deciding to put on the suit, uh, the creation of the suit, you know, the, the suit-up montage of all the, 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 you know, the gauntlets clicking in place, and spray-painting the red on, and seeing her up there, the red wig on for the first time, and uh, the ending is of, of naming her and like seeing her on the rooftop. Although the very final shot, I'm pretty sure they just reused one of the shots they had last year. Because uh, the, the actual camera movement was the exact same. So I'd have to go back and check it to actually make sure it's the exact same shot. But it looked like they just reused the same shot at, right at the very end. But I, mean, I thought all that stuff was fine. I thought it was, you know, I was kind of into it. I was enjoying that side of it. I think the music's really good, which helps. Uh, even earlier on, I think when she first shows up to fight the, the villain, which we'll talk about in a minute um and like he's sort of on the rooftop and he's got his, his big laser gun out and he's looking around for her um and there's this sense sort of going do 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 like and you know like, I, I thought that was a good mood i thought it felt kind of nice it felt like batman-esque but not traditional batman which is kind of perfect because it's meant if you have a bat sort of feel to it but well, it's a new character it's a new side of things all that good stuff um i i do have a big problem with one of the major plot points of this episode which is the fact that the plot revolves around a gun that Bruce Wayne designed. Um, 
Now, obviously, I don't mind Bruce Wayne or Batman designing, like, say, a grapple gun or an EMP gun or, you know, things of that nature. This is straight up a murder weapon uh, designed to stop someone wearing a bat suit. Now, don't get me wrong. The idea that Batman would have a contingency plan in case someone ever wore one of his suits, um, or even if he himself thought he might one day not be trusted and this would be a way for someone to take him down. But the idea of the way to, t- to take someone down a bat suit is to just to build a gun that can penetrate it. Because uh, we get this demonstration from Luke who, you know, shoots a regular gun at the bat suit and it just kind of bounces off. There's not even a dent. Um, you know, and I like the Kate said it stings though, because she did get shot last episode. Uh, or it was the first episode. It was one, you know, one of the two episodes. Uh, so that was a nice bit of continuity. But, like... He then pulls out this laser gun thing and says, now nah, this is designed to like go through the bat suit and it's just like, yeah, but Batman shouldn't want to kill whoever, whoever's wearing it. Batman should want to just incapacitate them because he's Batman. I, I, I mean, are we really going to do the whole thing where Batman in this universe just happily kill people? Because I will not be on board with that. I hate it. Don't do it. Um, so the fact that the plot revolves around that, I don't like. But that aside, um, nah, I mean, I would mostly get into it. They have Tommy Elliot here. Uh, who runs like a uh, security thing? Not not the same as the crows. He like runs like cu- community housing that's like got guarded com- communities and like security guards. But he's a big client of the crows, and um, he's not too bad as far as characterization of the character from the comics. Obviously, he's from a very big comic book storyline for Batman. Uh, I won't say which one because it spoils who he is, uh, who he becomes, rather. But I will say that the whole idea of his jealousy of Bruce Wayne, uh, being mad that his mother was saved by Batman because it meant he had to put up with her for for years uh, rather than just collect his inheritance. Uh, but instead he had to like help someone who was who was, who was was disabled. He had to like care for her. And he's he's kind of a dick about it and feels resentful over it. That, that lines up with who he is without doing his exact story. Because it's, it's not exactly what happened, but it's in line with the kind of thing. They've also shifted the timeline. And in the comics, like, him and Bruce are about the same age, uh, and they knew each other as kids. Um, and, you know, the, the idea that Batman saved his mother um, around the same time that he saved, you know, or didn't, or failed to save Kate's, you know, mother and sister is a definite shift in you know batman's already operating and tommy's obviously still a kid so they're not the same age in this at all um but you know the characterization and his attitude and all that stuff is interesting let's not also gloss over the fact that he said because he knows bruce wayne's batman and you get that right away because he assumes bruce is back in town and he just sort of has this look when he looks at case like this because batman's back in town i know bruce is back um obviously we know that he's not really back it's actually harlot's been wearing the suit blah 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 but he says that I paid someone to riddle me the answer. And I'm like, oh, okay, we're, we're teasing a Riddler uh, of some sort. Okay, cool. Cool, 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 cool. Um, I was into it as a reference. Uh, so, yeah, the, the whole plot is that, you know, he's actually stolen this weapon from uh, the Wayne, you know, science department or whatever. And... Kate's essentially figured out that it's him and that he has a reason to want it and so on. And she goes to this fundraiser party that he's throwing on his own building. It's really high up. And she, you know, she notes at one point, like, oh, you've got a nice view of Wayne Tower. But notably, it's looking down at Wayne Tower. It's taller. It's looking down at it. And, you know, it's, it's, again, it's his ego. So I'm like, okay, that fits with his character. I'm, I'm into that. I'm into that stuff. And it makes me wonder if we're going, because he's going to arc him at the end. You know, they, they arrest him and I'm, I'm wondering, like, are we going to go down the path of what he becomes? Like, are we, is he going to end up being able to do a thing and that means that he can be this thing? <laughs> like, and again, I'm avoiding spoilers here <laughs> for, for anyone who doesn't know. But those of you who, who know Tom, who Tommy the is, you know what I'm getting at. Like, will he become that in this show? I would say possibly, uh, even probably, uh, because I made a point of introducing him and I don't see them using the name and then not having him come back later as uh, the fully formed character. So... Especially if we cast someone else first as well. I'll leave it there. I don't want to say anymore. But, uh, so, I actually kind of like what this becomes when he's basically backed into a corner uh, and confronted by her. He essentially turns into Dennis Hopper from Speed. Uh, you know, if you think of the opening 20 minutes of Speed, where Dennis Hopper's holding, like, people in elevators for ransom, he's got all of his elevators in the building sort of rigged to explode and, like, drop. And he like, kills an elevator full of people to sort of prove his point. And then, like, 
we have two other elevators. One has Kate's father and stepmother in it, who were trying to escape at the time for reasons in a B-plot, which I'll get to. And the other one has uh, Mary, her stepsister, and Sophie and Sophie's husband. Uh, so and we have like all this going on so this is kind of the big inspiration for kate to go back to look and be like okay i need to be able to do something on my own blah blah i need to be able to take him the only problem i have here really is that luke for some reason like and this is not even this scene it's like earlier on when he's talking to her in the cave he says to her that the city's behind you kate and that includes me and i'm like really i don't feel like there's been a moment where you've turned here it felt out of nowhere that he's all of a sudden supporting her the idea of her putting on a suit um i'm okay with him having that turn it just felt a bit sudden and like just here it is you know we're gonna have a moment where he sees that she's doing good and he kind of smiles and says you know what i'm going to be this woman's alfred or this woman's luscious fox if maybe that's a better comparison i'm going to be a bit of both um but you know they make the suit and she goes up and like i say i like the scene where tommy's like sort of sneaking around the roof and sort of not seeing her and we get again some very speed s things where the the, the the elevator's going down and she like has to like grapple it and try and hold it up just because the the actual elevator cables are gone and all the rest of it it's set up early on there's a gadget that's like a sort of two-way grapple that goes on either side um i do kind of like that they're setting up some various gadgets especially if she uses them every so often like did we get the uh the various gadgets that he introduced her to back in the last episode um again do we get this double grapple thing again like you know hopefully they kind of remember these and they don't just disappear um so that was that and i i'll tell you one thing that worked for me a little bit better here as well is there was a lot of uh, little character things that definitely was better there was some stuff that didn't work for me as well there's a scene earlier on where sophie's like training with her husband and they're in like a it almost felt like a scene from krypton where they're like combating with gloves on and there's like people standing around and they're in this mat in a really dark room but as they're fighting and sparring and practicing um she's having flashbacks to the scenes from episodes one and two where she tells kate to move on and this was a really tedious like minute or so because it's like we just saw we just seen all these these moments in the last two episodes they are not that old and it just felt like we were wasting time um but i will say that there was more stuff that worked in the supporting cast for me in this episode than there has done so far i think mary was definitely always the most likable out of these characters and i actually did a bit of research this week to remind myself who, if any of these characters so sophie was based on the character in the comics i confirmed that this week because i was curious and then mary seems to be a character as well from the comics she's not usually kate's stepsister but she actually is a character who wanted to become like the flame bird to go along with uh, kate's batwoman as part of batman's team in the detective comics uh, during rebirth which was only a couple of years ago and kate was basically like no go and like finish like you know college and postgrad and you know after that you know, you've got your life sort of sorted then we'll talk about you know i'll talk to batman about it but you know you're not ready to like, be a full-time like vigilante or superhero so it did make me immediately go like hey are we going to see mary eventually suit up as uh, as someone now admittedly they've made her a, a doctor so they're, they're going the leslie tompkins route more likely but it would be interesting if we get like a flame bird on this show uh kind of her robin again if we're not going to get uh, stephanie brown batgirl or someone else then uh it could be something to go go down eventually but she she uh she has a couple of nice moments she has she's get, she ends up getting forced uh sophie upon her to be her bodyguard because it's like oh alice could be around right so she she sort of has a couple of moments with her at our campus where sophie's like oh you're scaring all the guys away i'm just here to meet my future husband kind of it's, she's, she's almost doing the bruce wayne thing in order to like put people off the scent she's like got this like you know illegal like like down to earth like clinic for people she's um pretending to be a ditzy college kid it's kind of funny actually it's, it's almost exactly what bruce wayne does you know pretend to be the, the the drunk billionaire kind of thing um but there's actually a couple of funny moments with those these two later in the episode which made me like them both a little bit more and i i definitely like mary more and i always did but i think i like they've both been up a little point just a little bit for me because uh, there's a moment in the elevator uh when they're going up to the party and kate gets in the elevator and there's a moment where uh like kate's like what's going on here and you know sophie's like oh i've been hired to protect or be a bodyguard or whatever and mary just kind of like looks over at kate and kate just sort of mouths i'm sorry and like and and mary's like i know 
like like they're just kind of mouthing things at each other about how awkward this is and i actually thought it was vaguely amusing and then the other thing i thought was amusing is later on uh, so so kate has a scene with uh, sophie's husband where he's like you know she never told me about you where did you meet her uh, it's like oh i went to you know academy with her and he's like, oh that makes sense but later on when they're stuck in the elevator during the you know the actual like threat the crisis when it's uh sophie her husband and, and mary um he starts bringing up in front of her when they're trapped in the elevator about, hey, how come you never told me who Kate was? You're, you know, this was this is our boss's daughter and you never mentioned you went to, you know, at the military academy with her. And she's like, oh, we weren't that close. And it just, the camera keeps going down to Mary and she just like has this look in her face and she's just like being really awkward. And the best part is, is that they pry the doors open and he pisses off to get help. So they're finally left alone just the two of them, you know, knowing obviously what the history is. And she's helping Mary up from the elevator onto the, the floor and she says you better not say a word and mary has her like her phone in her mouth and he's like I don't and like and again it was just a little amusing bit and obviously after this um uh sophie sees mary knows what she's doing because she's helping like she's actually like getting to the solutions for the the injured people that were on the elevator that, that, that crashed down um before the paramedics are even coming up with those solutions and like sophie's kind of looking at her like wait you're actually really good at this like what the hell um so but no, there was those little character beats that were kind of funny, that kind of played. Now, the actual stuff with the husband kind of finding out about their past, I'm not looking forward to that. Um, Kate having like a weird flirtation with this bartender uh, who says she wants to give her a call at the end. Eh, you know, I wasn't really feeling much of that either, but it's, it's you know, whatever. Like, but there was definitely some moments with these other characters that I actually kind of enjoyed in this episode, which is more than I can say, especially for Sophie. So Sophie's had the short end of the stick so far because... All of her stuff has been about her backstory with Kate, and that's been some of the worst stuff. So that character's had nothing of value, really, up until this point for me. This Her being with Mary actually gave her a couple of fun little moments that felt kind of okay. That felt like they are kind of fun. And hopefully, as we get out further and further away from the start of the show, where they have to give us this backstory stuff to try and build some drama immediately from, and we just get onto new plots and new ideas uh she can become a character that will actually be quite enjoyable to have around and not be you know this shows you know tommy or uh eddie because that's kind of what she no not not hard i mean i guess it's her husband that feels like the 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 eddie (laughs) she's the tommy no she's i mean not really she's more the lot (laughs) other like all these comparisons to other shows she's a kind of a combination of these other characters that ultimately felt worthless um, they never really get past their opening, like the start of the show's point for them. Like it wouldn't surprise me if Sophie does die by the end of the season because I d- I don't know what purpose she might have beyond just the initial drama of what she means to Kate. But these little moments made me think, oh, maybe there is stuff we could do with her. She could be a likable character outside of this. I mean, Mary definitely has a future. Mary has some interesting stuff going on. And again, Mary, like going back to her, like disguising what she does, like she comes back from the clinic and she puts on like a fancy dress as if she's been out partying all night. And you know that's what that's when uh, Sophie first runs into her. So you know moments are okay um so that's fine um obviously the one thing i've not talked about spock uh, Spock talked spock spoke talked you know what i'm trying to say is uh, alice is alice is part of this episode where she comes to see kate or in fact no she puts on the bat signal it makes kate show up who shows up in just civic clothes and they have this talk and kate's like i want my sister back and um and so on and so on and alice what does she say to her something like something, something about um giving her a chance or something but anyway kate says if you don't kill anyone uh in 24 hours i'll reassess like you know wh- what i do with you kind of thing and she's like oh you're gonna be so annoying and again i think alice came off a little bit better for me in this episode she's not necessarily feeling like the comic book version of her character by any means but i thought she was a bit more fun in this and i think i almost do feel that the, the obviously there's still, still some problems with the show there's some cw elements you know ruby rose isn't like the best actor in the world uh, but she has the physical presence when she's Batwoman, which is which is good. It's, it's, a, it's a big part of the role, of course. But I do think that there's a lot of pilotitis, which actually extended beyond the pilot and into the second episode. And there's still some of it here. And I think because this is the one where she gets her red, you know, hair and like logo, and she decides to be Batwoman. Like it kind of feels that like the first three episodes are kind of one big pilot in a weird way. And I think this is definitely the strongest of the three. And I think part of that is not just because those Batwoman moments are, are pretty decent, uh, but it's because I think I think the elevator plot uh, from an action point of view is kind of fun. I think Tommy Ellis is an alright villain uh, who ties into Batman lore, which is fun for us as you know comic book fans. But I think Alice as well kind of comes across a little bit more interesting because it kind of sets up this idea of her being around 
And instead of being like, you know, this constant like trying to push her like the Joker, although she might become that uh, as time goes on, uh, there's this interesting relationship kind of forming between them where they can kind of meet up, but you know, you know, Alice breaks into her dad's apartment and kills this guard, and immediately goes, "Oh, Kate's going to be so disappointed." And you know, and she, when she calls up, uh, you know, Jacob Kane, and uh, she's playing the cello, and it's you know, it's her cello from Cheltenham. She's like, "Hey, you taught me to play, Dad," kind of thing. Um, she 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 came across a little bit better to me, and and this as a kind of a recurring presence. This this presence that's always going to be there to antagonize and. It's this sort of thing where Kate's going to get to the point, presumably, where she just believes that she can't bring her sister back and that this evil, you know, psychopath is just all that's left. But there's going to be that moment, right, where she sees a bit of Beth. She sees a bit of Beth, like, do something good or make the right choice. And it's going to be a very interesting, potentially. I mean, I don't really trust the CW as a whole to kind of pull this off, really. But, I don't know, she came across better. I liked her scenes in the apartment. Um, I liked her showing up. Because I, I liked her, because she's disguised as a crow, like, guard. So she's got this, like, crow uniform on. Uh, and it felt, I don't know, it almost fit her better. She's not, like, trying to look crazy with the outfit. She just was crazy in this other outfit. Uh, which I guess does feel kind of jokery, because Joker likes to dress up a lot. But he, she, uh, you know, she has this moment where she knocks out Tommy Elliot and, like, save Kate when she's dangling and save the elevator shaft. And again, Kate's like, if you kill anyone, like, you know, we're done and you're, my sister's dead to me. And she's like, I want me, I want her to be dead to you. But this is the thing. She, you know, Alice did find, like, evidence that Kate did look for her for a long time. She, you know, she found the map with all the crosses on it and, like, all the places they checked and yada, yada, yada. But, uh, yeah. So little does Kate know in this scene, though, she's already murdered someone else. Uh, it's kind of weird that we, she didn't find that out at any point in the episode. At least I don't think she did. I don't remember her finding out. Maybe she mentioned it in the scene. Maybe I'm just misremembering that part. But it was better. It was the best of the three. Um, not perfect yet by any means. Um, but, you know, we don't rate these episodes out of 10, but I would say this one just about great, like a, you know, maybe a 7. You know, 6.57. It kind of scraped to that rating, which I think is, which is good. It's good that it can at least hit that. And maybe if we keep kind of finding their feet and, you know, settle into some some so and i think it's because it, again we're, we're kind of over the 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 introduction i do think the the love triangle stuff do it does need to get sorted as quickly as humanly possible um you know sophie looking as like kate kind of makes a date with this other woman at the end and like that i just you know i don't really care <laughs> i just don't care uh hurry up and end that as quickly as possible please whether it's through death or people just getting out in the open and whatever i don't know I don't know. Uh, but Babylon was better. So that's that's good. That's good. Uh, which does take us on to The Flash, Season 6, Episode 3. It's called Dead Man Running. Um, what, what, what even happened here? We had... We had uh, Rosso, or Rosso, Rosso, Ramsey Rosso. I just want to call him by his other name, but they've not revealed it in the show yet, so... Well, actually, did we say it last week? I think we said blood work. He's blood work. Fine. He's blood work. Anyway, he, uh... He ends up working with Barry on a case. Barry kind of catches him, trying to steal Dark Matter at Star Labs, even though Frost told him not to trust him, and... Uh... He kind of can tell that Barry knows that he's going to die, just like him, just like his mother, and... Like, he's facing it with bravery, and that's... You know... Whatever, but... You know, Iris and Barry agree not to tell the rest of the team that he's going to die, just to tell them about Crisis and what's going to have to happen and so on. And I thought it was weird though, they're like, hey, that's this, this universe ending thing is going to happen in seven weeks. So everyone's like, hey, well, let's go on it immediately. Ralph and Cisco are like, yes, let's do this. And he's like, no, nah, no, nah, everyone should take a day. <laughs> Come back with a rest, with rested, you know, rested minds. And I'm like, really? <laughs> The multiverse is going to die in seven weeks. That's all you've got to fix this. And you're like, no, let's take a rest. Let's take a breather. <laughs> oh, this show. This show. Um, but, yeah, so... What, what were various plots? Yeah, so they're looking into this villain. It's actually the guy that Bloodwork infected back in, like, episode one or two. Um, he's running around like a zombie. He's called Romero... Which is obviously a reference to George Romero, who created Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead, you know, the modern zombies we know them, so it's a, it's a fun little wink-wink. 
we have you know we we have uh barry investigating with him like does that i don't know ultimately he's like oh we can't keep this a secret you know because uh, frost kind of figures it out so iris is like oh yeah we have to tell them so they they tell cisco and 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 ralph uh was, was joe in thingy there if i was joe even in this episode i don't remember joe being in this episode i guess he i mean he's not listed as credit only in imdb so i guess he was at some point i don't know I don't remember. Oh, maybe he's there when they've got, uh, I think he's he's in this scene when they've got Ralph's mum in the, you know, when we first see Ralph's mum. But from that point on, he kind of just leaves and it's just, it's, uh, it's Cecile with Ralph, uh, and his mum looking into, like, trying to get security footage from, like, a, an illegal gambling ring to prove that she wasn't the one who robbed the store. Um, and there's some wacky stuff here, uh, with... Um, Ralph using his powers to get the footage on a USB stick while his mum loses at gambling. Uh, I did like at one point Cecile, you know, when they suggested that they do something, Cecile said down here. And I, I just like that we're playing with the height difference between, uh, you know, her and Ralph because she's like quite small and he's like, you know, relatively tall. So that was amusing for what it was. Um, yeah, the main plot, like, you know, uh, again, it's probably probably much like the other two shows. It's probably the best of the three. I guess I should be happy they've all trended at least a little bit better. I mean, it's not great. Um, you know, Barry th throws Frost a birthday party at a club and it has like a snake eye guy from last season, uh, or the last two seasons there, DJing. And she's, I don't know, it's weird there's like a montage of them all dancing and stuff i don't know um but yeah obviously there's a new wells uh harrison nash wells who's looking for eternium <laughs> was the red crystal uh if this is a thing from dc comics i do not remember its name uh or, you know or if, if i if i read about it from dc comics i've not remembered its name but uh, he's looking for that he's got a very different attitude uh iris and Who's with Iris? Cisco. Cisco's with Iris. Cisco and Iris go go and try and find him, uh, because someone snaps a photo. Um, it's the new assistant actually who almost went to the Iron Heights. Who gets really pissed when she sees this this uh, Wells character in the office and almost quits because she's like, ah, oh, you know, I want you to be honest with me and you know, blah blah blah. And Iris is is able to convince her to like, hey, just trust me, right? I I took a chance on you by hiring you. I'm asking you to take a chance on me and trust me for a bit. Uh, so this uh, Allegra character, like I mean, she's probably going to find out who everyone is in like three episodes time because the Flash can't hold that shit in anymore, uh, any way, shape, or form. But yeah, so I mean that stuff was fine, I guess. I it's um I don't know, like the episode kind of. Uh, uh, it doesn't feel super distinct to me. There's a fun little subplot with, with Ralph and his mum, although the drama it comes to at the end when it's about her lying to him about, like, this boyfriend being dead, and she's he's like, oh, you've been lying to me about everyone for years, and he's really pissed at her, but she's like, oh, I just want you to be happy and find love and do everything. Uh, it almost sounds like it's setting up for Ralph to leave the show this season if he's going to go find a wife or something, uh, which I hope he doesn't do, because Ralph is consistently one of the more pleasant parts of the show. So... Please do not do that. That'd be nice. Uh, Bloodwork does uh, basically discover he doesn't need the dark matter. That he having some of uh, this uh, Romero's blood, he can control it. He can kind of like move it around. Uh, it's him just kind of getting to grips with his powers, and you know, evil afoot from there. I guess uh, is is I guess what we're getting to. In that right, Firefly. Yes. Hey, look, there's Firefly. He's on. He's on both sides of the camera or both sides of the screen, rather I should say. Um, if you're watching the video version, if you listen to the audio version, you don't care. You don't care. So, yeah. I don't know if I've got anything else to say about Flash, to be honest. <laughs> Alright, I had a quick look. So there's two things I want to mention. There's two things I want to mention. What, just, so the end of the, uh, the plot with the, the, the Romero guy is that they actually trap him in the, the tunnel, right? In one of the cells, in the, the thingamajig. And he actually breaks out. He just smashes the glass like it's nothing. 
And then, like, Frost has a line about the cuffs not working on him. So they never really explain why or, you know, or even attempt to kind of bring up why he's kind of immune to all the meta dampening stuff. But he does. It does lead to a pretty glorious moment, though, where they have to... Because this is the funny thing, is that Barry has this thing. This was the other thing I wanted to mention. There's, there's kind of a subplot running through the episode where Barry gets mad at Frost for not caring if she kills people because she kind of throws him out a the bad guy out a window at one point. And because he's, like, undead, he he gets up and just walks it off and doesn't care. But Barry's like, you didn't know that would happen before you threw him out the window, so you can't be reckless like that. You can't just be willing to murder people that carelessly. And, you know, she kind of argues with him. Because Barry's basically this thing that he's going to use this seven weeks to prepare everyone to sort of protect the city without him. The idea that he's going to make sure they're all the best they can be. Which is laughable, because Barry being a teacher, as we've seen with Wally, as we've seen with, uh, with Nora, is a terrible idea. He is garbage at it. Uh, Frost says as much at one point, and she's absolutely right. Um, he's trying to give all these lessons, and it never it's never really felt like he's learned them himself. He still feels just as, like, flip-floppy on his morals and on what he believes and what his tactics are. Like, episode to episode, if not, like, scene to scene, that it's kind of laughable that he tries to instill any of these, these ideas in anyone. So that's kind of frustrating. Um... I was going to say it's kind of hypocritical that they have to kill him to beat him, but I suppose to be fair, by that point they've established that he's undead, that he is literally a zombie, so therefore he shouldn't care if they kill him. So, you know, okay. And maybe that's why the, 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 the meta dampeners don't work on him, because he's dead. He's not technically a meta, because he's, he's not alive. <laughs> that logic kind of works for me, actually. Uh, yeah, you know what, fine, fine. They never really go into that, they should have really explained that better, but, you know, whatever. But yeah, he actually explodes. Um... Now, you don't get to see the actual explosion itself, but you do get to see a lot of the blood splatter coming away from the explosion. So it looks quite nasty anyway, even if you get to see the actual pop. Um, you get to see a lot of blood hit uh, Barry and Frost, who's not Caitlin. She's Frost the whole episode, which is interesting. Uh, she's more likable than Caitlin and is more interesting and funny. So, you know what? Just keep her around. That's fine. Um, again, it was probably the most interesting episode of the three so far. I think Wells, a new version of Wells being back, who's hunting something um and knows who the council of wells are because he, he's like oh those idiots like, you know he refers to them uh, when cisco brings them up so you know that's what it is but yeah i, I thought i'd mention the the the, the end of the, the the romero stuff though the the blood plop plopping is plopping around um but that will take me on to the final show we're going to talk about today which is Arrow Season 8, Episode 2. It's called Welcome to Hong Kong. And sure enough, they're in Hong Kong. Uh, and notably, uh, to his credit, because one of the things me and Connor were uh, debating last week is if it may get stale if each episode is just uh, Oliver in a different Earth and each episode ends the same way with the Earth, you know, being destroyed by the antimatter, antimatter uh, you know, wave. And to his credit, it didn't do that at all and there was no threat of it doing of it doing it this episode because this episode didn't take place on another Earth. It took place on Earth 1. It took place on the, the regular Earth because uh, we were in Hong Kong on our, you know, our normal Earth that Oliver came from. And uh, the Monitor's pissed at Oliver for, like, saving uh, Laurel and to an extent Diggle, although Diggle's not from the other Earth, so theoretically he should have been saved anyway. But um, he's like, no, I didn't kill them. They're around. And... Laurel's pissed because she wants to go back to Earth 2 and the the little doohickey, you know, that, that Diggle had isn't working anymore. She, so she actually separates from the group. She's not willing to accept that her universe is dead. And Diggle is understandably to Oliver, like, hey, give her time. She's grieving and accepting this. She has to go through this process. And it's actually Lila ends up showing up to help her uh, go to this tech guy uh, and makes him, like, fix it. And it still doesn't work. And then he's like, well, they'll try a different Earth. And she doesn't actually try it, but he looks through his little computer. How he has computer readings of different Earths, I don't know. But he's like, yeah, Earth 39's there. Earth, you know, 17's there. Earth 2's just missing. It's not there. Uh, and this is kind of her having to realize and accept that, hey, your Earth is dead. Like, it's not there. That entire universe is white from existence. And so that's the thing. That's like a subplot running through the episode. Lila gets involved because they're back in Earth 1 and uh, she also gives Diggle some, like, access codes to stuff or whatever. Um, and they're there to get this scientist dude. Uh, I think it was a doctor. I want to say Wong, but I could be making that up. No, Robert Wong. I was right. Okay, cool. 
Um, uh, they run into Chain of White. Uh, Katana shows up to save them as well at one point. Uh, so, so Katana is like on Team Arrow. Uh, you know, so her, Diggle, and uh, Oliver, you know, try to grab this guy. Chain of White's going after him. Uh, it kind of devolves into this thing where uh, they actually steal this virus. It was the same virus that I think we had back uh, in the season with Hong Kong, um, if I remember right. Uh, but China White was trying to get that. Oliver ends up with it, but they have the the scientist. So Oliver sort of agrees to make a trade. Everyone's like, "No, this is like so, this is like a bio weapon. You can't give this to China White." So of course they're planning on like you know fighting her, and they do, and you know they, they, all, they all jump out at the last minute. And um, it actually looked for a second that Katana was going to die, and I I kind of believe she was going to die just purely because like, hey, it's the last season of Arrow. Is it likely that the other shows are ever going to use her? Maybe they're going to do a shock death here to, you know, give this last season some dark weight to it. You know, start killing off these, like, these recurring side characters that we've seen before. Um, she does get saved, though. Uh, uh, Laurel, you know, Black Canary shows up and saves her at the, the last second. And with a scream. And the others, you know, do whatever. There's, there's actually, like, three or four good fights in this episode. They're not really long fights, but, you know, even at the start of the episode, as soon as, like, Diggle shows up to where Oliver was talking to the monitor, and like, hey, there's bad guys coming. It's just so random, like, oh, there's bad guys in the hallway. <laughs> but we have a little hallway fight that's okay. Oliver, like, power bombs a dude through, like, a... Not quite a table, but, like, through some stuff. And later on, there's scenes where they walk into, like, a room and they have some fights. So there's, there's some decent combat. Uh, it's, it's been kind of on point so far this season, uh, relative to what the show has been um so the episode like it it wasn't as funny <laughs> as last week's <laughs> by any means but honestly i think arrow because it's you know doing this sort of multiversal mission in each episode is feeling a little bit distinct because it's having different characters in each episode it's actually feeling like it's got a lot more you know a much better pace and a lot more drive than it normally does it's not like stretching the story out to 22 episodes and because of that this episode felt like it had a simple thing he has to get these that you know that this uh this virus sort of thing um i will complain that laurel at one point when she's mad says to uh Oliver, this was all your fault. If you never came to my Earth, you know, all of my people would never have died. And I'm like, nah, your Earth was going to be dead regardless. <laughs> I'm, I'm fairly certain. Um, you know, that, that that's why I think the monitor was telling me, hurry, because it's like, hey, that's Earth's dying, like, tomorrow. So get my damn dwarf star or whatever. Um, yeah, so so that, that was the thing. Um, we find out that... Uh, Lila is also working for the Monitor, and uh, yeah, that's kind of weird at the end. And yeah, and she's like, "Hey, you, you sure this is like saving things? Oh, all will be all will be known in time." Blah 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 blah. He's been all you know, secretive as he does. Um, so that's worth mentioning for sure. You know, it, like yeah, okay, fine. We'll see. We'll see how Lila plays into things. Um. But for the record, like, this is probably easily one of the best seasons of Arrow after only two episodes, just because it's not, like, it's not pandering or, not pandering, that's not the right word, it is pandering in places, but it's it's not wasting time like it normally does. It's not great, but, like, it feels like it has a direction, a drive, and because I'm excited for the crossover, everything feels like it's building up to that. Um, you know, everything feels more relevant than it normally does. Like, normally I just have no reason to care about Arrow. <laughs> but everything this season feels like, oh no, this is going to be at least somewhat useful. With the exception, of course, of the flash forwards to Mia and her team, uh, which is basically just Connor goes to, you know, they go to this bar or whatever, and uh, JJ shows up, so we have this brother-brother, like, conversation... Uh, the bad guys storm the base and get uh, William, presumably hostage. And was there any more to it? <laughs> Did we just end kind of there? Like he's in trouble, and yeah, there wasn't much to happen because like, there was literally the first two or three flashbacks. I felt like almost nothing happened. Like, the first one was them getting back to the bunker, just kind of complaining about what happened. And he's like, "I'm in charge now." Blah blah blah. And then they go to the the bar. Uh, the, you know, there's a cliffhanger where the brother walks in, and then. They're at the table and there's a cliffhanger where, yeah, the bad guys, like, has has goons stormed the base, I think. I think that was it. Um, but, you know, we have this thing where it seems like Connor blames himself because it feels like his parents, like, were so determined to make sure he was, 
uh he was you know he was fine because his father was bronze tiger and he maybe had a rougher start to life that they, they kind of neglected jj and that's why he's who he is and why he's evil yeah whatever <laughs> whatever you know that's what it is um you know i arrow is better than it usually is and i think a lot of that is that it gets to just be a lot more creative with this stuff and it, but it has like this direct this clear direction that's going in it so its entire purpose is to yeah maybe give us like some goodbyes with some various characters but its entire purpose is to really be the the, the show that gives the most backstory to the crisis and i think because of that it's inherently far more interesting than it's maybe ever been before um yeah i said it but ever <laughs> um i know people have fond memories of the first couple of seasons but i you know like the first couple of seasons weren't great like they, they, they were watchable and they had some good fight scenes and uh they weren't as laughably bad as, as stuff that came later but i you know like for the it wasn't like i think people have this really like conflated rose tinted memory of them because of how bad it got after i i think if you take out the flashbacks i would say i'm mildly enjoying this season because i'm excited for crisis and it doesn't feel like it's plodding around as much um you know we had to have laurel get over the fact that her earth was dead and it makes it more personal for her you know when she's helping with crisis stuff it makes it personal that her earth is already dead that she's really fighting for something right um so yeah um and i have to wonder you know we talked last week about how like maybe mia comes to present day and gets stuck there and that's why the crossover is going to you know the the, the, the spin-off rather is going to have her with laurel and dinah but them still being you know their ages i guess there's also the possibility that it's just the, the the end of crisis does that like the end of crisis like just reshapes reality and all of a sudden mia's with them and you know crisis because you know i have to expect that we're i don't think we're necessarily going to merge the earths although it, it makes sense if we're going to if we're going to merge supergirl's earth with with barry and oliver although the reason not to is that it, there's going to be a lot of plots where it's like why not just call in supergirl but then again there's a lot of plots in arrow where you could be like why not just call in barry because he could like zoom into the room and take everyone out immediately and there'd be no danger um so i guess it doesn't really matter in that sense but uh, that would be the one reason why we wouldn't do that but yeah if we're going to merge supergirl and the other earth together then this is the time this is the time um so yeah arrow was fine um you know it didn't annoy me which for an episode of arrow was uh, with the exception of the flash forwards but with the exception of those it didn't annoy me and that's you know <laughs> worth mentioning um which leads me to the the, the 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 question of which one is best of the week you know what what, what episode uh am i picking and you know i it's tough it's definitely not flash I don't think it's Supergirl. I think it's between Batwoman and Arrow, actually. I feel like neither one's perfect. Neither one um, or is perhaps even close to perfect. I feel like they're both kind of on a similar level this week where I got a fair amount of enjoyment out of both um, for very different reasons. You know, Batwoman is because it's new and it's maybe starting to finally click into place a little bit. And I actually liked a lot more of it than normal. And because it's the new show, it's kind of exciting to actually like some of it. Um, but still with a lot of problems. And then you have Green Arrow, or sorry, just Arrow, sorry. Uh, where, it, again, it has its flash forwards and it's not necessarily great otherwise, but and there's an inherent interest because of what it's building to. And, you know, I feel like you know, Laurel's a character especially here who I think is benefiting from this kind of reset where she became kind of a hero on her, her Earth after leaving. And th this kind of happened off camera and I, I think that's what makes it work because now we have her and it's, it's kind of almost like a refresh where now she gets to just be like have this new sort of set 
like origin almost where it's like no my earth is dead and now i i have to fight for that i have to fight because of that um and it gives her this kind of refreshed kind of direction and i can just forget everything that happened before <laughs> which is nice um you know, I don't know, like, I just, the other thing is, is that it's cut off a lot of characters. I think one of the big problems that these shows all have, and Arrow especially, is that it had too many characters to juggle. And I think, obviously there's a couple of characters in this episode that weren't in the last episode, and vice versa, but essentially having this core trio of, of Oliver, Diggle, and, and Laurel is making it flow better. You know, we had obviously Lila in this one as well, but... um. It's making it just feel a lot more focused, which is good. But it wasn't as laugh out loud funny as last week, because <laughs> it wasn't like Tommy and and and, and uh, Adrian Chase Prometheus was that his name? Was that what we were calling? I can't remember. Connor would be so upset with me for that. Um, so I will. Um, I'm going to give it by a smidge. Just a smidge. To Batwoman. Just a smidge. And I, I think it's I think it's because it's just nicer to like some of that, I guess, because I'm gonna like, you know, Arrow's ending, like if I hated that right now it'd be fine, because it's almost over. Batwoman I've got at least a, a longer season, if not years and years of it to go. So, if if that can show signs of improvement, I think that's more encouraging to me. But it's, it's kind of, you know, it's close. It's close. I will say this is definitely the best week for these shows since we came back. The bar's not super high. Um, I don't think anything's firing in all cylinders. Um, although Arrow, compared to itself, is probably the closest to doing that. Um... But this was definitely a week where everything was at least a little bit better than the previous week. So if they can kind of continue that trend, and that's a dangerous hope to have. Although, Batwoman arguably is the one that's the most likely to continue the trend because it's new and it's it's very possible this new team are just finding their, their feet. And a lot of shows will improve in season one over the course of it. So, you know, hopeful, hopeful. And Supergirl can be better than it is right now, so hopefully that does too. So, you know, hopefully things shake up. But... Uh, yeah, that's what I'll go with. I'll go with uh, Batwoman by just a hair, um, out of the optimism of it going in the right direction. But that is uh, that has been the episode of Television from the Multiverse. Uh, so it's a little bit later this week, um, fitting this in. Um, it's almost weirdly harder when I don't have like a deadline with Connor to get it done by. It's just, uh, it's hard uh, because I end up just devoting time to other things instead of watching the shows. So it took me a little bit longer to watch them. But um, here we are. Uh, show's done. Uh, we'll see you next week. Connor will be back. I'm sure he'll drop maybe some a couple of thoughts he had on these uh, when we do come back. And yes, um, there we go. So thank you for joining me. Uh, if you want to support uh, Television for the Multiverse and everything else that we do, you can do that over at patreon.com slash TV. You can support us for as little as $1 per month. And we have been discussing uh, the potential of maybe doing some of the old shows that we did before that people liked us talking about, you know, Gotham and Smallville, as some kind of Patreon thing. Um, no hard promises yet, especially since, um, you know, doing it in a way where it's actually something we can schedule in. Because recently we've been having trouble like, making sure everything we're supposed to do has been getting done. So adding an extra thing onto that is, is kind of a silly idea right now. But uh, it's something we're talking about. It's something I think, uh, you know, because we like the idea. One one thing I like, at least, I like the idea of every show we have on Mail Fuzz TV uh, having a perk on Patreon that's something that's relevant. So that if you're just a fan of TV for the multiverse, you can donate a dollar and get something relevant to your interest. And in that case, it would be, you know, a, a, a review of Smallville or Gotham, maybe those two rotating, you know, week to week or something like that. Um, or maybe just one of each a month or something. I don't know. Um, but that could be something that's, that's fun, uh, that, that could be, you know, yeah, put a dollar, you get that stuff. But obviously if you like more of our shows, then great. But, you know, because we have a bonus episode of Screams After Midnight at the $1 tier. There's a bonus episode of the Sci-Fi Movie Podcast we do, the Atomic Cinema Experiment, you know, once per month on Patreon. Um, there's voting rates for those movies at the higher tiers and, and things like that. Uh, but, 
yeah so um yeah go to patreon you can support us uh, without paying us though uh by rating the podcast on apple podcast giving us five stars helps where people find us uh, you can also like and subscribe and comment what you think of the the episodes and stuff in the comments on youtube and ding the bell as well to make sure you get all the notifications because sometimes youtube's a dick and doesn't actually send out notifications especially if we've been putting out a lot of content it, it kind of penalizes us for putting out too much content which is weird because surely that's good for youtube potentially i don't know anyway <laughs> <laughs> but that is uh that is television the multiverse thank you once again for joining me hopefully this was a decent episode despite the fact that i'm running solo um so let me know in the comments but that is me so thank you once again for watching or listening i always appreciate it keep watching superhero tv shows and remember that sometimes we screw things up for the better